welcome to Inside the Admissions Office, your one-stop shop for expert advice on the smart way to get in. My name is Ellen, and each episode I'll bring you an interview with a former admissions officer, a graduate of top college, or an admissions expert. These interviews will take you inside the admissions office and will be full of behind-the-scenes knowledge, first-hand experiences, and application tips that will help you get into your dream school. If you'd like to chat with one of these experts, you can sign up for a free consultation at the link in the description of this episode. Today, we'll hear from DJ Rock, the former assistant director of admissions for multicultural recruitment at MIT, about what an MIT admissions officer really looks for in college applications. Hi, DJ. How are you today? Hi, I am so happy to be here. I'm doing great. How are you? Good. So just jumping right in, I'd love to know a little bit more about yourself and then in particular about your educational background. Um, Yeah, so I grew up in New Jersey, um, and when I did the college process, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I really didn't know what I was doing, and my family wanted to help, but couldn't always. Um, So that's really what sparked my long-term passion. Um, I attended Boston University and studied journalism and political science um, in my undergraduate degree um, for my bachelor's, and that's what I thought I was going to do, but then really when I was applying for jobs, was passionate about the, the work I had done in the admissions office. I worked in college access for a while. Um, And then when I was working at MIT, also went to Northeastern University and got my master's of education in higher education administration. So what I like to tell folks is I went to college and then I worked at a college and then I went to another college where I studied colleges. Um, So I've really just been in depth in the higher education um, bubble for quite a while. But yeah, then I worked at MIT and I think what was really interesting about that is I learned a lot about STEM education. Um, I always tell a lot of my students, they probably know a lot more about calculus than I do, but I know the sequence of calculus that colleges look for and moreover, the ways that students are able to apply their projects into real world situations. So I think that was part of the the really exciting part about being someone who had studied, you know, social science and writing as an undergraduate and then kind of moving on to a STEM oriented school. It's interesting that you say that about calculus, because that's actually something that I know we talk with parents about a lot, is that when they have students who are very skilled and talented in STEM, we always have to remind them, you know, your former admissions officer doesn't need to know uh, organic chemistry. They need to know how they can help the student communicate that in layman terms to an audience who isn't educated about that, because that is what I think makes an application stand out is being able to communicate something, even if it's a very complex topic. For sure, for sure. And I think, you know, there are places where it's really great in applications like in portfolios, because what we used to do is those portfolios were reviewed by experts in the field, right? But in your application itself, um, you know, myself and my colleagues were folks who studied education and writing. And it was sometimes there were things that we were like, this sounds like it might be really great, but they haven't communicated us into a way where we're able to to really understand its impact on, on humans and society and making the world better. So It's great to, I think, know your audience for the different components of your application. And if you're just a math whiz, super into calculus, maybe have your friend who's in the arts read your application and make sure they can follow everything. And likewise, it just makes sure everything's on the same level. Could you tell me more about what your role entailed at MIT? Yeah, so I had kind of two main roles, um, and this happens at most places where admissions officers will be on some sort of team where they'll do other projects and work. So I started on the visit team, um, which meant if you've ever taken a tour of a college, I helped coordinate our tour guide program. Some of our visit programs delivered those really fun information sessions where you got to learn about the school. My um, latter part, I worked in the multicultural recruitment team, really thinking about how we thought about populations that didn't always see themselves at MIT, like young women, um, students from underrepresented backgrounds, students from schools with not lots of resources, and how we um, kind of sent the message that MIT is for everyone, that they also were able to apply. And then throughout that work, every admissions officer in our office would also then review applications and read them, and then serve on the selection committee. So this deciding, you know, who got in and having some really tough conversations. So I had different projects throughout in different parts of the process that I was really invested in. Every admissions officer will always have that that core piece of reviewing applications and making decisions. Before we jump into my questions more specifically about MIT admissions and what your day-to-day looked like, I'd love to know, since your role was so much about bringing underrepresented groups, you know, women with people from other cultures who aren't 
who didn't see themselves at MIT, I'd love to, if someone is listening right now and they can't see themselves at MIT, they don't imagine themselves being admitted, what would you say to them? You know, I think for all colleges and universities, especially in the U.S., I think there are a lot there's a lot of information. There's a lot of information online, in movies, and some of that might be real, and some of that is just false. It's stereotypes, right? This is silly, but there's a, a movie, Legally Blonde, um, that I love, right? And I remember getting, um, when I came to Boston for the first time, and saying, like, oh, this wasn't filmed here. Like, this is what this actually looks like when I was exploring Harvard Law, right? And so I think there are a lot of stereotypes. And when we think of colleges, we think of certain types of people who may be at them. And so what I would encourage students to do is really be thoughtful about the research they're doing? Are you talking directly to students who go there? Are you looking up if there's a certain culture or identity that's important to you? Does that school have clubs and resources and students a part of that group who you can talk to? You know, a lot of people would say, if I don't like math and science, I can't go to MIT. And we had really great economics programs that people might not have known about. So I think what's really important for students is making sure that the information or your perceptions of colleges are not rooted in stereotypes. They're rooted in actuality. And what you'll see is that there's four students at MIT, students from all over the country. Um, you know, MIT is a nearly gender balance. So there's a lot of things that people, you know, don't assume or would assume um, are not true without getting the, the real information. I do have to brag that they did actually film Legally Blonde at my college. I went to the University of Southern California. So we did all have our Elwoods moment at graduation. Very special. It is a lot prettier than Harvard, I will say. <laughs> yeah. No, they would film TV shows there. This is like a little sneak peek for people to get excited about college. They would film TV shows there constantly and I'd be like walking to classes in the background of Shonda Rhyme shows. I think if you watch one ABC family show I'm like on a bench like taking a nap between classes. Could you walk me through a day in the life of an MIT admissions officer and maybe split it between the on season of when you're actually reading applications versus the off season where I imagine maybe you're doing recruiting work? So I like to think of like the academic year. So starting in September, um, most admissions officers would really be on the road. Um, we traveled a little bit less at MIT than most schools did, but you know, that would be going to somewhere in the country and coming to, to students, like making sure that if you couldn't visit MIT's campus, you still were able to chat with someone and connect and learn about what MIT would be like. So I might show up at some of your high schools in random parts of the U.S. or sometimes even internationally to give sessions and deliver information. Then once the application is due, everyone kind of assumes like if the application is due um, November 1st, that like we have a decision for you on November 2nd. And that's definitely not what happens. After November 1st, we all go home and we start reading applications. So I actually wouldn't see my colleagues for weeks at a time. I would work very long hours, day and night, but reading all of the applications. And at that part of the process, we were really trying to understand who you were, making sure that I read every single word, there were any questions or gaps or things that I was unsure about, making sure that I'd really tried to fill those in, and then summarizing this to a really concise couple of sentence summary of what are the major pieces in our applicant pool, right, that are going to help students. And then once we went into the committee season, my day-to-day -day was eight hours a day wrapped in a room with my colleagues, sometimes cranky, sometimes after spilling coffee on myself, and fighting about who should get in, right? And I think what I always say is I think that if, you know, an admissions officer came in in a good mood and had just watched a TV show and didn't spill coffee on their day, there would be a difference in decisions. I think that is part of the human process. And I hope when students don't get into college, it's something that they can keep in mind is that it doesn't mean they weren't good enough. But yeah, it's making those really hard decisions. And it's with those few sentence descriptions. So once we got into that part of the process, we weren't reading every word anymore. We were really reading the highlights of the student applications. And then we'd go into yield season. So something I think students don't always, the process is really scary and anxiety inducing. And you don't have a lot of power, right? You give so much of yourself in these applications. You hope that someone sees you um, and admits you. Then once you get admitted to colleges, everything flips. Students get all the power. So as a student, you now get to decide where you want to go. And colleges want you to come there. They want as many students as they've admitted to come. That part of the process, we really try to make sure students understand what we're doing, trying to dispel those stereotypes, as I mentioned, giving lots of tours and things like that so that students could really see if MIT was a good fit for them um, and if it was the place where they would be happiest. So I think the day-to-day -day looks very different throughout different times of the year. And so part of that and some of the big takeaways for students, I would say, is one, 
understanding how like important deadlines are, it's really great to get your application read early. And things like teachers of letter recommendation and stuff like that that come in later are totally okay because there are weeks that we're spending kind of reading things. So sometimes students get really anxious. What's most important, right, is that all of the portions of your application that you can, can control, like your essays, test scores, those things are submitted on time. And then I also think when you're corresponding with admissions officers, you know, we were not a regionalized office, but most other schools do have one person who reads applications and you know who reads for where you're from. It is great to email them and to be in touch with them. And if you don't always get an immediate response or things like that, you know, knowing that cycle, there might be a chance that they're in committee fighting for you eight hours that day. Um, and so just kind of knowing that and knowing the best ways to get in touch and ask your questions and where to send things to. But yeah, it definitely changed throughout the seasons, different times of the year. And that was, I think, the exciting part was you know, being able to fight and, and argue, um, which was kind of fun, uh, and then travel and meet students and then hear their questions and hear their stories and then see them in the application pool. Um, it was definitely a lot of fun. I'd love to just really quickly maybe establish, you mentioned students emailing admissions officers. What would you say as far as etiquette? What should students know about that communication? That's a great question that I get a lot. Everything that you submit to a college is going to be how we understand you with very limited information, right? I tell students the hardest part of this process is you're condensing your entire life, which could be novels and memoirs, into like a 10-page application with, with confinements. So I think what's really important for students, you know, obviously have good grammar in their emails and things like that. I also think it's really important for you to be thoughtful and intentional about why you're emailing. So things like, I got this really impressive update that's not on my application is great. Or I have a really nuanced question that is 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 complex, like, et cetera. But I think sometimes, you know, students just think to build a relationship, they just have to email. So they'll email generic questions like, what are the requirements to apply? Or um, how many, what's the average class size? And those are all things that are on the website often with a quick Google search. So I think you don't want to just send emails to send emails, right? You should be thoughtful about I'm going to ask this person for some of their time. And maybe it's advice on your application. Maybe it's, you know, there's a lot of different things it could be, but what is information that you could only get from the admissions officer versus, you know, what's online? Since MIT doesn't use the Common App, could you talk me through the components of MIT's application? MIT has a separate application, so you'd have to refill in all of that information, unfortunately, about your address and email and all of that. And then instead of one long essay, MIT just has chopped that essay into five shorter essays. Unfortunately, you know, you can't use that main Common App essay that you use uh, to apply to MIT, but the, the pro is you get five different kind of stories to tell or angles to show of yourself. And then for letters of recommendation, interestingly, we would require, you know, obviously a guidance counselor or a college counselor, a math and a science teacher. And then we also required an English or a humanities teacher. Um, and something that a lot of students don't know is that at MIT, you are required to take courses in, you know, the social sciences, the humanities. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that you did well in those subjects too. And then, you know, standardized test scores always being super important. Students often ask me if there are cutoffs. Um, MIT publishes their SAT ranges of the classes they admitted every year on their website. So you can pretty much go on and see if you're in the range of students that are admitted. And then if there's a number of APs that we required and there's no requirement, I think it's generally about pushing yourself, you know, in math and science areas, the areas that you feel the, the strongest in for MIT particularly. Um, but it depends on the context of your school. There's no specific cutoffs for GPA scores and all of that. We talked a little bit earlier about with your role, especially trying to bring in a more diverse populist MIT, and you talked about how it's basically gender neutral now, which is great. If you had to sort of specify what kind of students MIT is looking for, maybe not demographically, but in terms of personality, passion, interests. It's a great question. You know, I don't think there is one personality type in particular that MIT is looking for, right? So I think we want a well-balanced class when we were admitting classes. And we would talk about, you know, needing quieter students and louder students and strong leaders and students who didn't always love leadership and athletes and artists. And so I think, you know, MIT is really diverse in the sense of in terms of interest and hobbies, there is a lot to do. But I do think some things that tie MIT students together are, um, I think all students, regardless 
regardless of, you know, their interests and stuff are really passionate. Um, and so, you know, at MIT, there are students that are really going deep. They're working long hours and taking on lots of stuff, but because they genuinely are enjoying, you know, that hard work and that academic rigor and, and learning about really complex ideas. I also think students are, who are not afraid to take risks. I think MIT is a little bit of a daring place. It's very experimental. So I think students who follow the, we would call it cookie cutter mold of applications where they add one sport, one community service activity, one academic club. You know, I think MIT was like, we're looking for students who are like, I've dedicated all of my time to the robotics team and doing all of these robotics projects and my community services robotics. And I'm just the robotics person. Like that's my life passion. Um, or someone who's like, I really love applying math in all these areas. So every club I go into, I apply weird math stuff in it somehow. Like, I think it's just students who are passionate, experimental. And I think regardless of your academic interest, still at your core, having that passion for quantitative analysis. So, you know, even if you're an English major at MIT um, or a literature major, I think still through that subject, finding a way to incorporate math and science, because at its core, you know, MIT is a STEM focused school. And so students who are really good and passionate about math and science um, were really important in the process as well. What do you think makes MIT unique in comparison to other elite schools? I mean, the obvious is that it is very STEM focused, but outside of kind of that obvious answer. I think the STEM focus is really unique um, because, you know, at MIT, you could join the orchestra um, and also find folks who are really passionate about STEM. Um, or when you're at crew team practice, there are those folks. So I think that's something that brings the community together. And I think that what makes it unique compared to some other schools is that really tight knit sense of community. I think because everyone has to go through the same required courses in calculus and physics that are really hard, um, there's that bond, right? Like we got to help each other. We have to get through it. I think something that's also unique to MIT is housing. So students are allowed to select the dorm that they want to live to amongst various dorms that all have personality types. So at MIT, it's common for students to stay in the same dorm all four years instead of there being like a less fun freshman dorm and then like a better senior dorm. Um, it's more about like, are you... Um, someone who loves to paint your hair and get into punk rock music and paint the walls and build things, there's a dorm for that. Are you someone who loves really clean, pristine, like someone comes and cleans for you, there's a dorm for that. So there's all different types of places that students can live. And again, I think that builds to like the really strong sense of community too, because the people you live with often have a lot in common on that front. I think just the other, and what I really loved about being a student in Boston in the greater Boston area of Cambridge is just like, the access to so many other students and academia and being in the area. And that's true of other schools, but, you know, being able to cross register and take classes at Harvard and then just walk across the river and see friends from BU, Boston University. Like, yeah, I think the location is a great selling point for any of the, the Boston area schools. Are there any major misconceptions about MIT in general and then about specifically applying for MIT? I think that a lot of folks assume that you can hate, you know, the humanities and get into MIT. So I think, you know, one of them is you still have to have strong grades in those areas and you still have to get strong letters of recommendations from those teachers. I also think that there are a lot of conversations about needing to, again, check all of these boxes. And I think the most important ones are, are you pushing your, and the conversations we had were never this class, this class, this class, yes or no. It was always, and what is offered to you? Are you pushing yourself? Are you challenging yourself? Are you also able to balance and not burn yourself out? And so I think that really looks different for different students. And so that's why when I get questions like, is this the number of APs I need to take? Or is this the number of this? It's always like, let's take a step back. What is the bigger picture here? And then I think the other is that admissions officers know STEM. So I think like even in your essays, like I've had students who have pushed back and said like, but DJ, I love the STEM joke. And me saying like, again, like I if I don't understand it, like, you know, there's a chance that I would have been there not understanding it when I was there. I think the last is that MIT students have fun. So there's a question about having fun and every student thinks that they should write about chess or something that's still academic. But like the students that said, I love to sing and dance in my room, or I love to go hunting with my dad or whatever, like whatever their thing was, that was just actually something they did for fun. Those were the strongest essays. So I think also reminding folks that MIT is a human place, you know, it is STEM oriented, but it is okay to have fun in your application. And in your, in your experience reading so many applications, what were the major mistakes that you kind of saw again and again? 
I think the biggest one was students writing what they thought we wanted to hear. So like another essay question was like, what is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome? And a lot of times students would write about like accomplishments they had or things that we had already read about. And like, I think the students who took risks, I'm like, I'm going to write about something really personal and deep, or I'm going to write about not the time that like the robotics robot malfunction during the competition just like we're really pushing themselves to think outside of the box or reflect and show that a little bit of who they are it doesn't have to be a sob story but just i think the deeper reflection that comes across is really helpful versus the like again what should i do for fun writing the academic answer filling in all of the classes specifically in math and science they think are most important and never taking ap or history if they're really interested in it because they might be able to make ties to archaeology like i think those pieces are are big misconceptions as well and you've talked a little bit more about the mit supplemental essays but if you had to say at very a very high level what do admissions officers really want to see in those supplemental essays what themes do they want to be brought out I think it's two things. I think one high level, they want you, right? And I think like, so this is so much of the application is just numbers, data. This is the part where your personality comes through. Like we really get to understand who you are and the stories you want to tell. I think the other piece is when constructing a great application, I think in order to understand you in only 10 pages, we want to understand what is in your application, right? So if you're telling us that your passion is bio in your essays, and then we can look and say, oh, that's why you took AP bio. That's why your letter of recommendation comes from your bio teacher. That's why you're the president of the bio club. It helps us guide your application. So I think you really want to think about like, what are the major pieces of who you are um, and major pieces particularly of who you are in your application? And then how do you share those with us? So in your role, you were specifically working as the assistant director of admissions for multicultural recruitment. What would you say to listeners right now who maybe have had fewer opportunities? Maybe their high school doesn't have a robotics club. They don't have so many of those opportunities that a lot of students get. So how can they still kind of make themselves stand out with their application and make an impression? I think for every single student, regardless of the resources that they have, we're always looking in context in your school for markers of excellence and greatness, right? So what that means is, you know, if your school offers 10 APs and has a 4.0 GPA scale, then, you know, an MIT admissions officer might have expected you to take particularly the APs, if calculus was offered, if physics was offered, um, and you say that you want to be an engineer, looking for those specific classes, looking at your GPA out of 4.0, if you have a 4.0, that's great, right? There could be a student at another school whose scale is out of a 7.0 GPA. And for that student, like a 4.0 is actually not that great. Uh, That's actually not a strong GPA. And for that student, their school might only have two APs. And that student may have taken those two APs and then gone on and taken additional college level courses. So I think that for any student, what I always tell my students is, what is your, what are your peers doing? And if you want to be admitted to a top tier school, I think it's trying to stay on track with your peers that are on track for top tier schools. So, you know, taking the classes that they may be taking. Doesn't mean you have to take every single one they take, right? Develop your interests, go deep into the areas that you're passionate about. But if everyone takes on average five to six APs, then maybe you try to take five to six APs. Um, And if we were looking at a school and there was a student who took less, it'd be harder for us to argue to admit them when there are other students at their school who may have more APs in that area. And I think that's just one example, right? I also think things like extracurriculars are undervalued, right? So if your school doesn't have those academic resources, there are online courses that you can take. There are summer programs programs. There are extracurricular enhancement programs that you can do. So I think there are also lots of ways that you can build up other parts of your application and strengthen them outside of your academics. But I think, again, for every single one of my students, it's just going to be MIT is often taking the top students of the high schools that they're reviewing. Whatever that looks like in your context, which is going to be different in every school, um, is how MIT is going to look at you as an app. I'm also interested in perhaps non-traditional STEM students, maybe someone who's come to STEM later in their high school career, so they haven't built up a very strong portfolio or experience level, or perhaps they have, you know, like you said, an interest in the arts or the humanities that's supplemented with this interest in quantitative analysis. So how can these applicants also make themselves stand out? Yeah, I think what's essential is really understanding what those specific programs are at MIT, right? 
students I work with who are studying literature were really into digital publishing and wanting to understand the tech side so that when they went into e-publishing, like they could communicate with tech folks who were building platforms for them. So, I mean, that's one specific example, but really making sure that you're not, you know, writing an application saying, I love psychology and psychology is my favorite thing in the world. And then MIT doesn't have a psychology major, um, right? Or, you know, the way that, that MIT viewed it is cognitive science and neuroscience. So really making sure that you understand those departments. And oftentimes what you'll see is that there is still some connection to STEM in them. And the biggest thing I would say for non-traditional STEM students and all students is making your interest seem genuine. Go deep in the areas that you are. You know, if you love figure skating and then you make a research project on physics and how that impacts figure skating and then you start a volunteer club where you help folks figure skate, like that is easier for admissions officers to hook onto and I think can really help you in that process. Um, making those connections to STEM and then doing the research. And you can do that by going to the departments and seeing, you know, what are the professors who are currently teaching this department researching? What are they publishing? That's often probably the concept that they'll be teaching in the courses that they're also instructing. I find that STEM kids are very ambitious and they start younger. They're even in middle school, maybe having their eye on MIT. So if a younger student's listening to this right now, and maybe they'll be applying to MIT in two years, three years, four, five years. What can they do right now to really build their profile so that when that time passes, they'll be a good candidate? I would just really at this age be exploring interests, exploring various topics, and then trying to go deep in the things that stick out to you. I think, you know, identifying what your research or kind of passion is in the field of sciences takes a lot of people a really long time. And the earlier that you can do that and expose yourself to things that may be outside of your school, like YouTube videos, like books, outside communities that are also really into STEM, I think exposing yourself to the opportunities that are out there to explore these areas is really, really important. And then from there, once you've find that and you have five years of going deep into math, like I think where you'll be able to go by the time you apply to MIT will be a little bit deeper. And is there anything else you'd like to share with potential MIT applicants? I still think I think is interesting is we used to say anywhere between like 40 and 60% of the students who applied to MIT could handle the academic. So academics and testing are so, so, so important, but we had to narrow that pool down to about 7% of students that we were able to admit. And so I really think that students need to think about their extracurricular profiles and all of the things they're doing outside of the classroom. And then the last thing I would say, and this comes from a blog post on the MIT admissions website, right, is I think the students who get into MIT are often not the students who said, here's the plan I've had to get into MIT the whole time. It is the students that said, I really love this thing and went deep and passionate about it. And the good thing is that you apply to MIT and if you get in, like bring that passion there. And if you don't, you don't feel like your whole teenage years were wasted or, you know, going to this place that you may have handled. And again, someone had a bad day and that's the reason why you didn't get in. Um, so I think going deep and finding something that you're genuine about will hopefully not only make you happier because you're enjoying what you're doing, but I also think ultimately increase your chances of making it from that pool of 40 to 60% of qualified folks down to 7% that really stand out. So yeah, I think that's the last piece I would leave with is just really making sure that students develop those genuine interests, and then go deep, like really go deep, really dedicate time to those interests, really ask your former admissions officer, your graduate coach, anyone you're working with at Ingenious for that support to go deep in that area. Thank you so much for joining us today, DJ. I'm sure our listeners appreciate your insight into college admissions and MIT. For more information, check out our blog linked in the episode description. We'll link our most recent blog about MIT's essays for the upcoming cycle. If you have any questions or you'd like to request a topic for a future episode, go ahead and give us a follow and send us a message on social media with the hashtag Inside Admissions. That's all for now. Thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next time as we continue our journey inside the admissions office.